Sorry to bother you with fish again, but you know, I work on fish. Um, my name is Marco, I work in, here at college in Sherwood Park campus, and I work on academics. This is my lab, I want to thank my supervisor, Martin Brazo, and Richard, Thomas, and our technician, Anna. Richard basically uh, done half of my introduction, so we'll go very quick. Um, today, modern vertebrates are divided into a big group, like the sacrosome, jolly stage, very ugly and very not diverse. And then we have the nyatostome, that comprise the cartilaginous fish, the chondrichthyon, and the osteichthyon, uh, bony fish, and tetrapod. We know a lot about the relationship of these modern groups, but what we actually don't know is how they diverge. And the reason is because they diverge very, very uh, far back in time. So looking on, only at the taxa, we have very few information about them. And it looks like there is, oh no, there is this gap, so we cannot really understand, but actually this gap, well, it is a gap, but there are a lot of forms that we can use to populate this gap, and actually have a sequence of character acquisition that can tell us how we get from a jolly ancestor to the jolly vertebrate. Um, on this, this is a paraphyletic assemblage of same yantostome, you have some jolly form, the green, can you see green, yeah, green one? Green one and the orange one are the placoderm. Right. That's what people think about the placoderm. There are three t-shirts with a Dunkelostos in the ocean. Don't even try, they are mine. <laughs> <laughs> but placoderms are a more diverse group of fish. We have, like, of course, big predators like Dunkelostos. We have uh, flat, like, bottom dweller feeding forms. We have, like, uh, some placoderms with claspers, so, like, evidence of internal fertilization that are very a uh, diverse group of fish. Usually they are nice as this, but most of the time they are not as nice as this, this guy. The group I'm interested mostly in are the petalictid. Petalictid are kind of like ray looking fish, let's say like that. And probably like bottom dweller form, such a feeder, 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 who knows. Usually they come, what well, usually? Sometimes they come like this, this is lunaspis. Is the only petalitid that we know the entire body. They can come like this, this is one of my specimens, just yes, this, or they can come like plates on slabs. Um, right, so petalitida are very important because they show kind of like unique combination of characters that you cannot really see in any other of the flacoderm. I'm gonna show you an example of this. Like modern nyatostome, the like current nyatostome, and the facial nerve. This one, the pink one, that divide before the orbit, and they have a jugular vein canal that is not invested in the brain case. And some placoderms are like that, like Arthrodina, like Dancolosteos kind of guys, are like that. Uh, Petalictid have a different shape. They have a facial nerve that divide inside the orbit, and they have an invested jugular vein canal. So they look like different from the other placoderms. And this is not might be a problem, but actually they look quite similar to the Jones, the Anderson. They have a facial nerve that don't divide, I mean divide very after the orbit, and they have an invested jugular canal. And this uh, brought people to think, wait, maybe petalites are intermediate Joe semi system. I'm gonna spoil this talk saying that we still don't know if they have a Joe petalite. So um, the problem with petalites that have been included uh, very rarely in analysis. This is like the most recent uh, nyatostome analysis. There are two petalitida and 21 placoder. The one, the one that we know more, lunaspid, complete body, no endocrine information. And macropetalitis is basically uh, the brain case that has been described 15 years ago. So we actually, we don't know a lot about petalitida. And they look like to be a very important group. But it's even more complicated than that. Like petalitids are divided into two different groups. The macro petalitids, they are like elongated, long snouted petalitids. And these called quasi petalitids that look like they are petalitids. And they have like uh, less elongated skull. Um, they, are, they all come from China and they are the earliest member of the group. These two groups look very different, especially when we compare the brain case of these two groups. So the macro petalitida, are weird because they have like uh, brain morphology different from the other placoderm. Also, they have a 
brain is composed by one singular ossification, while all the other half of them, this one looks like a dinosaur a little bit, I, I really like it, have this uh, rhinocapsular ossification that is between uh, the rest of the brain case and where the, the nasal capsules are. And the petalic, and this uh, was thought to be a synapomorphy of placoderm, but these placoderm don't have them, so they are not placoderm, or this is not a synapomorphic character of placoderm, right? The other group of petalictic, the quasi petalictic, they have a brain case that look like an arthrodite. They have like this uh, bifurcated vagal process, the proportion of the skull is different, they have like the nasal capsular here, what compared to the orbit, while in the other macropetalate, the orbit is here and the nasal capsule is here. So like, um, usually uh, people that describe quasi-petalite that they say, if you take into account only the brain case, this is an artery. And the reason why they think it's a petalite is because outside is that they have some feature, like usually when people describe petalite that they say they have this Petalitic uh, sensory line pattern that is having this sensory canal like uh, converging together. Sometimes they are merging, sometimes they are like kind of X. And all the petalitic that have been described have been assigned to petalitic because of that. But actually, many other of them have these things. They have the cross, or they have like all this uh, line converging in the middle. So what is actually a petalitic? A petalitic? We still don't know. We cannot find any synapomorphic character that can um, define them. And this is a big problem because, as you can see, some of them look like normal placoderm, let's say, and some of them look not like normal placoderm. And this is, could be a very important debate uh, to understand if placoderm are a monophyletic group or not, with all the implications that uh, this can bear. Uh, oh, there was another slide, but I forgot. Okay. Um, one of the possible synapomorphic character, but we can see uh, mainly in the macropetalitida, is they have like a very different um, cranioterachic joint. After that, I have this like horizontal cranioterachic joint where the skull is connected to the thorax. And petalitida has this weird uh, vertical cranioterachic joint. And this is present only in, macro in some petalitida, well, the one where we know the cranioterachic joint. So, it's a little bit of a mystery. Believe it or not, the last and uh, one of the fewest um, analysis of petalitida have six petalitida out of 19 taxa, and they have eight placoderm uh, as a whole, so they have and 22 characters. So they demonstrate that petalitida is a group using 22 characters and six petalitida. This doesn't sound right. In fact, the latest big stem and crown nyakrosto matrices split the two petalitic group. This is the macro petalitida, and this is the other, the quasi petalitida. So this is a big problem because we are struggling to see any character that can merge um, the two different groups. So what I'm doing is to scan some nicely preserved, let's say, petalitida, or some of them are nicely preserved and with micro CT to try to understand better their neuroprenal morphology and see if I can find any uh, new character. So basically that's what I do. Uh, I can see uh, reconstruct the brain case and brain cavity morphology. Right, I'm going to propose some character now uh, that I, uh, I'm trying to like, test in a phylogenetic analysis to see if it's actually a, a synapomorphic of petalitida. It's a close up of what we are going to look at. Right, so crown nanthostone and may, mainly all the other papoderm, but petalitida, this one, they have a pipitary vein that go across uh, the ventral um, brain case and connect one orbit to the other one. It's there, so it's like a singular canal. Some of them have it, but go outside the brain case and then come back again. This is the orbit for a normal uh, nanthostone. Petalitida have this weird, very short pipitary vein that go inside, it's kind of like Sac, no one actually named this before, like ventral sac that go into the orbit. And this is absolutely similar to what is in Jolly Station. The trigeminal nerves do kind of the same. In crown stone and in Petalitida, it's associated, um, it's not associated with the pituitary vein. In Petalitida, it goes in the same sac as the pituitary vein, as in Jolly Station. In this, oops, in this. Start over there. 
So Pitalik that look very, very similar to Jolly's fish and very, very different from other placoderm. And potentially this can be a synapomorphy of Pitalik, but we can only see it if we have the endocast. That might be a problem. The big picture of this, and is what I will try to find at the end of my PhD, is if Petalitica are not like other Placodon because they show a different morphology in many characters of the neurocranium, that means that Placodon might actually be a paraphyletic assemblage and that Petalitica might be very close to the very base of the crown of the Joel Stem Yatsostone assemblage. So they can tell us how the ancestor of the Joel vertebrae, the earliest ancestor of the Joel vertebrae, looked like. And this could be many implications. One of the if use it, we can do it with this is to map brain evolution, brain, nerves, brain, and also usually people that think that Joe evolved, well, we still don't know actually, but evolved for predation, no? because it's black them are a monophyletic group, maybe, and we don't really know where this like bottom dwelling form go, we can tell that Joe evolved for predation, but actually if we, if we know that the earliest Joe vertebrate was not a predator, but was like, I don't know, um, filter feeder or suspension feeder for this can actually tell us or maybe tell us that we don't know enough about why jaw evolved what was the function of the jaw the jaw in which ecological context jaw evolved and this is a very interesting and major question because if all the other vertebrae that many people are studying are so successful it's because of that but this is a still an ongoing problem and I hope to finish soon to test this phylogeny and thank you.